welcome back, I hope you're doing well. Continuing with our series on Euripides back eye, today I want to talk to you about Argon in Euripides back eye. We're going to have a look at the first appearance of Pentheus. So where we left off from last time when we were looking at the chorus was um, the chorus setting the tone for Bacchic rites before Tiresias and Cadmus enter. And what we're going to see next is an argon. An argon in tragedy is essentially an argument or debate between key characters. And this comes up when Pentheus enters and Cadmus is the Tiresias is the prophet who we might remember from Oedipus 2. They're Pentheus' elders. So it's a really interesting dynamic in this argon scene where we see Pentheus being the kind of rebellious teenager and lashing out against um, Tiresias and Cadmus too. Cadmus and Tiresias coming together, they're friends, they think it's a pleasure to hear one another's voice and we can pick this up from around line 180. My dearest friend here at my house, what pleasure to hear your voice your words always make sense so Cadmus unlike um, Oedipus when we looked at Oedipus the king has the good sense to listen to Tiresias something that Pentheus does not share okay and they are in agreement about praising Dionysus um, and they offer to share a chariot to the mountain but Tiresias says that's not the best way to glorify the god um, and they decide to kind of hobble up to the mountain together. With magic ease, the god will lead us there. So this idea of being physically fortified by Dionysus is something we'll come back to when we see the attack on Pentheus that comes up later in the play. Um, are we the only citizens to worship? Yes, says Tiresias, only we have sense, the rest have none, okay? So they are in the minority, but they've decided um, that they are going to praise Dionysus and keep themselves safe in doing so. <clears throat> and Cadmus gives us a clear indication of the arrival of Pentheus. So again, in dialogue, we have really key clues as to what's going on on stage. Tiresias, I'll be your eyes for you, interpreting my vision into words. I see Pentheus rushing to the palace, Echion's son, whom I made king of Thebes. He looks so flustered, what is going on? So Cadmus is sort of a fatherly figure to Pentheus um, in so much as he has made him the king of Thebes and we have this generation gap between them. Pentheus has been out of town and when he comes back and he hears about the Bacchic rites, he kicks off. <laughs> They say this craziness is for the god, but they like Aphrodite more than Bacchus. I have arrested some of them, my men have them in chains, hands bound in the common jail. So um, Pentheus' main issue is that he feels that the Bacchae are using this ritual as an excuse to go off and have extramarital sex or premarital sex. Now in Greek, they would be classed as the same thing. Moichea is extramarital or premarital sex. Um, it's something that women are accused of, men aren't really accused of this, and it's the idea of basically having sex when you're not supposed to, when it's not in accordance with what's right for the family or what's right for the oikos. Okay. Um, and now he proposes to hunt down the ones that have gotten away up to the mountain, so presumably those who have left with the chorus. Um, I'll hunt them down out of the mountain, Aino and Agave and cousin Actaeon's mother, Ortonoe. I'll dress them up in nets of iron and stop all of this Bacchic wickedness right now. So Pentheus goes on a huge rant about everything he's going to do. You talk them into this, Tiresias. You want to introduce this new divinity to profit from new trading prophecies. Your white hair saves you. Were it not for that, I'd chain you up with all those minad women for introducing wicked mystery rites. Festivals with sparkling wine and women are an unhealthy cult, in my opinion. I mean, I think it sounds great, but fair enough. So Pentheus um, is again accusing Tiresias of foul play. And remember, we've seen this before in Sophocles' Oedipus the King, when Oedipus accuses Tiresias of um, really speaking on Creon's behalf in an attempt to dethrone Oedipus and undermine his kingship. And we all remember really how that panned out for Oedipus. Disagreeing with Tiresias doesn't tend to be a very good move in tragedy. Um, and Tiresias is almost quite patronising of Pentheus in this argon, so if a clever man has solid facts, it isn't hard to speak impressively. Your tongue is fluent and you sound so smart, but there is no true wisdom in your words. 
Authority and rhetoric may come from pride, but only wise men help their city. So Tiresias makes a really extended case um, against Pentheus and tries to encourage him to see the light and to praise Dionysus. And then Cadmus weighs in finally to mediate and broker the situation. And this takes us up to say 3.30. Dear boy Tiresias gives good advice. Stay home with us. Don't live outside our ways. You're drifting up into the air. Your senses make no sense. What if you're right and he is not a god? You should still say he is. What lies can bring our simile the glory of having born a god? So he's saying, look, he just benefits us all if you just shut up and get on with it. Um, but Pentheus is again very dismissive. They try to offer Pentheus an ivy wreath as well. So remember, clues are in the dialogue. Cadmus and Tiresias are wreathed and ready to praise Dionysus. And we can see their um, affiliation by the way that they're dressed. Um, and Pentheus vows, get your hands off me, do your raving elsewhere. Don't smear your silliness on me. I'll find that man and I'll punish him. So Pentheus resolves to attack the man who's brought the, the Dionysic cult to Thebes. He has no idea that it's going to be Dionysus in the form of a human himself. And that's something that we've been primed for. We also have a layer of dramatic irony when we see what Cadmus has to say to Pentheus here at about line 335. Remember Acteon, how he died, his darling dogs whom he himself had fed, ripped him apart in the hills and ate him raw because he boasted he could hunt with hounds better than Artemis. Don't share his fate. Um, and if you know the outcome of Bacchae already, if you've seen uh, Bacchic Vars painting, we know that Pentheus is going to be ripped apart by his own mother, Agawe. So a few things to take away if you're thinking about this episode as an Argo. The generation divide and the power divide. So Cadmus and um, <clears throat> Tiresias are Pentheus' elders, but they're not necessarily his betters. Pentheus is the king, but only because Cadmus made him the king. And so he has provided a lot of airtime. So notice that even though these three characters are arguing, it's not Stichomythia. Pentheus gives a big speech, Tiresias gives a big speech, Cadmus gives a big speech, and Pentheus caps it off with a big speech. Because of the, the unusual power dynamics, they each afford one another the floor um, in order to make an extended case. Pentheus is quite indignant and he's very, very direct and rude and forceful to Cadmus and Tiresias, who are perhaps more considerate toward him because he is the king and because they're trying to persuade him. So it's an unusual argon in terms of the power dynamics and also the length that each man affords the other. Notice also the irony in what Cadmus has to say because we know that the Arcteon myth is particularly pertinent. And here we've got the premise of the play, we've got the setup. Pentheus has arrived, he's told us what he's planning to do, and by having older characters mediate the situation, we know what's at stake for Pentheus at this point. So I hope that was helpful for you in thinking about Argons and Greek tragedy. Um, look out for more videos to come. Next up, we're going to have irony in Euripides back eye. Okay, so don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell to keep up with what's going on on the channel. Okay, stay safe. Thanks.